you know, I used to live on the other side of the hill, uh, and now that I live in Shangri-La with, with most of you, I have <laughs> never been surrounded by more people who are out and about traveling around the world. I mean, if, if we had the time, I would take a poll here. I know some of you are just back from Tanzania or Africa or uh, New Zealand. Um, so, but for the rest of us who do not get to leave the office very often, we're in for such a treat because um, Oliver Klink and Rick Marai are truly world travelers. Oliver has been to 112 countries and Rick about the same number. I didn't know there I didn't know there were uh, I didn't know there were that many countries in the world. But anyway, we're going to have a great evening tonight. Uh, these two world travelers and award award-winning photographers are going to have a fun conversation and we'll have a chance to see their beautiful work. Um, but let me introduce them. We have here Oliver Klink, um, who has traveled the world to capture uh, um, the intricacy of our ecosystems. You're going to see both of these photographers have a, a lot in common. They both love the world. They're trying to better the world through their photography. They talk about what's right in the world and what also could be improved in the world. Uh, Oliver's artistic goal is telling stories with his images, revealing our cultural changes and the environments we inhabit, and, and most importantly, providing insights into our current state of the world. Oliver, you're going to love his, his nice accent. He was born in Switzerland and currently lives in Las Gatas with his wife and two cats. His studies <laughs> in physics and photography were the catalyst for his love of light and the complexity of our existence. In 2007, he left his high-tech career to focus on fine art photography and to lead photography workshops around the world. He moved to digital photography in the early 2000s and is a particular fan of piezography, mm -hmm. uh, which is a process that he believes matches and even exceeds what is capable um, when using traditional darker Processes. That's a tall order, my friend, <laughs> but you, you've got a beautiful artwork there to prove it. Uh, in 2016, Oliver was selected as a critical mass top 50 fine art photographer uh, and also best of the best uh, in the emerging fine art uh, photography category by the um, organization Black and White Gallerist. <coughs> Oliver is currently just finishing a monograph called Cultures in Transition. It'll be published by True North Editions, printed in Italy, beautifully printed, and the limited edition book is scheduled to be released in November 2018. Let's uh, join me in welcoming all <laughs> If that weren't enough, we have CPA's favorite hometown uh, administrator, uh, director, <laughs> Richard Marai, Born and raised and educated in the San Francisco Bay Area, Rick recently transitioned away from academia after teaching for over 35 years um, fine art photography in Northern California's Central Valley. His ongoing fascination with documenting sacred sites has generated travel to locations within Asia, India, South America, the Middle East, Russia, Western Europe, and Oceania. In addition to passionately pursuing his art, Rick actively exhibits, is widely collected, and his work has been published internationally, including Lens Work, Camera Arts, Silver Shots International, the BBC, and other respected journals. Recent honors include first place awards from the Travel Photographer of the Year in 2008, 2010, 2011, <laughs> and, and being an ex-professor myself, I have a quiz for you. Where did he also recently win first place in an international juried exhibition? <laughs> I'll wait. Upstairs. Right, doctor. Yeah, right here. You saw Rick's work gracing the front door. That was before I was hired. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now he's no longer yeah. allowed to show his work. To <laughs> See, I'm, I'm glad you got it out of your system right. in yeah. a big way, man. <laughs> Uh, Rick conducts ongoing regional and foreign photography workshops to locations such as Italy, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, and Southeast Asia. And still, uh, once a teacher, always a teacher, Rick also hosts small group instruction as well as individual mentoring. Uh, join me in welcoming Richard Morocco.
tired of the sound of my voice, uh, have a great conversation great too. Brian, thank you. Isn't Brian great? <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I, would, I also want to mention that we'll have a reception afterwards so we can view the fabulous Art Photo Folio show that just went up last weekend. And uh, some of our artists, we have the workshop leader here, Willie Osterman, led the workshop this weekend, and his wife Michelle is here. We have some other Art Photo Folio artists, artists who uh, are still here. Anyway, so that'll happen after our talk. Um, it's a little bit of a background. Um, Oliver and I are members. Can you guys can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oliver uh, and I are uh, members of Image Makers, and I'm relatively new in the area. And so over the years, last I mean, two or three years, I've followed uh, Oliver's uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, work. And uh, I, lately, I thought, can you guys hear me? Not that you have to hold it. Okay. We'll see if that helps. Okay. Okay. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun, Oliver, if we um, talked about our work because uh, we have visited similar locations. And um, although the countries are the same, the style and the, and the, the uh, results, of course, are going to be entirely different. So I thought it would be, would be fun to, uh, to get together and talk about our work. And then we also want to entertain questions. So if you have any questions at all, comments, by all means, uh, uh, let's, 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 let's have them, okay? And so we're going to open uh, with, uh, Oliver and I talked about uh, what's the basis of how we work. First of all, like most artists, we work on projects, and that project re uh, uh, relates to a result in a, in a portfolio, which is a, a, a body of work. And so um, as we delve into our work, we have new discoveries and we have the opportunity to return to a lot of these countries. Um, Oliver, far more so than, than me, uh, but uh, so uh, the first country we chose is Bhutan, mm -hmm. okay, because uh, we visited Bhutan, I've been there four or five times, you've been there how many? About five, five times. About five so. times, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, uh, when we first get there, we have that culture shock of, 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 of any new location, and you photograph, and then we come back, we edit, and we find out that there are holes or maybe things that are missing. We can go back, fill in those areas, and, um, and we progress into coming up with a uh, portfolio. So we're going to talk about this. So I think what, what is really what I'm looking for when I produce a portfolio? It's something that you can present to galleries, that you can have an exhibit, or you can be published, right, in a different magazine. And then for, as the competition is really tough, right, to get wall space everywhere, you need to produce really incredible work. And that incredible work is not just about the quality of the images, it's the stories that you can actually add with basically what the project is about. And I think what I've seen in the last five, six years that I've been working in Bhutan is the stories that I bring back are almost more important than actually the images. So you go into deeper region, you go maybe more unique images, but people really want to hear about what was the experience like. So I think that's really something that you want to remember when you travel. Even if you go to a place only one time, Try to dig a little deeper about getting the stories from the people and then make, make something out of it. Okay, I'm going to start off with, <laughs> with my work. And um, uh, I just thought we'd include this here, project versus portfolio. They're basically one and the same. Uh, but I think Oliver and I identify a project, and the project in this case is going to be a country or a village or, <coughs> a, um, or a ethnic group within that country. And then, of course, that leads to a portfolio, okay? And uh, we're still working on these portfolios. I think, Oliver, uh, I think I don't think you ever end. It's, it's like your personal work anywhere. For those of you that are work, that do portraiture, that do landscape, it's never ending. Uh, you're just going to continue to progress. So uh, here's Bhutan. But just a quick sure. comment, just sure. comment. Sure. For me, the speaker is actually distracting. It is. Okay. Uh, there's a, Breathiness happening, so I'm not, I'm not sure it adds anything. Is that true? I don't know if that's true for others, but uh, all right. Yeah, let's get rid of this. How's that? 
Can you guys still hear us? Still hear us? Is that still yeah. good? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, we're, we're both teachers. We're projecting <laughs> Okay, well, here's Bhutan. And uh, it's, uh, Bhutan is, is, is becoming ever more popular. Uh, I think the first time I was there was in 2007. And when was the first time? For me, it was 2012. Okay, all right. And uh, Bhutan is a, it's a really interesting country. It's nestled between uh, the world superpower of India and China. Um, when you go there, how many of you have been to Bhutan? A lot of people. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> but uh, but it's, a, it's a very unique country, as, as some of you know. Um, it, uh, it's driven by uh, a strong uh, tr a traditional Buddhist values and the gross national happiness. Uh, which is really unique, and it is actually uh, uh, honored and observed in this country. So, one thing that is really interesting about Bhutan is the acceptance of the, uh, the king and the queen. So, they have a king and a queen, so it's king number five now. And then when king number four, basically, he was actually still pretty young, but in his 60s, he said, son, you need to start to lead the country. And then the son is like an Elvis, right? Really good looking guy. And he was a little too young, I think, to lead the country. So his dad, for about two years, was actually speaking almost on behalf of the, uh, the king. And then eventually, about uh, two years ago, he actually now, he's basically becoming a dominant person in the world. Uh, and then he meets like uh, world leaders. But what was really interesting is Bhutan has a really strong tie with India because they have military that uh, they help them with military. India built all the, uh, the powers. It's basically it's a big uh, hydro country. Hydroelectric, yeah. And then the king went and met with the uh, Chinese prime minister and he shook hand. About two minutes later, he got a call from the, uh, the <laughs> prime of India. They said, you need to make a choice. You cannot be uh, on both countries. So even if there is a country that is really known for gross national happiness, they have kind of their own OC little subtleties that they, uh, they need to deal with. Okay. All right, and I'm just going to talk about how I work. Um, I photograph predominantly people, and um, I rely on a more confrontational approach with photographing people because I enjoy meeting the, the subject that I photograph. And, um, that's part of the experience is of learning about the country is learning about its people. And so uh, when I take a look at my work here, we're going to talk about, we're going to see some contemplative, uh, reflexive kinds of approaches, and then we're going to see the choreographed kind of candid images too. So I'm not afraid to mix them up. Um, I had my background uh, being a good West Coast photographer. I started off with 8x10, 4x5, and zone system. And, uh, but my background is photojournalism. And so I, tried to, I wanted to figure out how to combine the two. And so um, what I'm doing now, I think, is kind of a, a fine art, ethnographic documentation in black and white. Uh, but I really value the print, the, the fine print. So anyway, let's take a look at this. Um, I also have, um, I have, I use different techniques. Uh, I use soft focus uh, lenses. Um, uh, Carnie Brisson once coined the phrase that sharpness is such a bourgeois concept, <laughs> and uh, I agree with it. I'm not afraid to mix it up and to do uh, soft focus images. Uh, one thing I also do is I carry a flash. I use what's on, I, I, I utilize a technique called open flash, where I use a long, a longer exposure. I use a flash, and so what it does it tends to fill in the shadows, and at the same time, with a slow shutter speed, it blurs. I find but, that excuse me. the shutter speeds could, are... Could you, yeah. could you just explain what soft focus means? Uh, uh, or the soft focus? Or the technique, does that mean the whole image is out of focus or just a portion of it is uh, out of Pretty focus? much, yeah. This is a plastic lens that I, that I use. I use a, a lens maybe, hmm. uh, but I use a plastic lens. It's, it's similar to the Diana, kind of the Diana uh, a kind of uh, ethic uh, attitude. <coughs> and so I use that. And it's a pretty much obliterated image. Okay, but I'll show you another one later on from Laos that's totally soft. Okay, and also I printed on mulberry paper, so it tends to be really a lot soft. I, I think the challenge when you use this type of lenses is you don't really see the immediate results, right? Where does film? Where are you still shooting film on those images, or was yeah, it? This uh, is digital. But is it early, digital, right? Yeah, <coughs> yeah. And I, I enjoy 
uh, having a more seamless uh, result. Mm -hmm. Cause, um, and, and in teaching, I never recommended these things, uh, but here I am using them. But shutter speed, I think, is one of the strongest, one of the most potent creative controls that we have in photography. Uh, Carney Brisson again talks about the decisive moment. Uh, I like to mess around with the, uh, the serendipitous minute, okay? <laughs> Where you're doing high exposures, you're not quite sure what's going on. We were just at Bob Colbrainer's house and we we're looking at his beautiful, beautiful photography and he's mixing it up with slower exposures and fast exposures uh, with his landscape. And that's a real potent way, a real great way uh, to become sensitive uh, to your subject by exercising different uh, shutter speed techniques. So again, I'm using slow shutter speed uh, with a flash. Um, this is another slow shutter speed with a flash. So I'm getting the splay soft focus image with, and a flash is recording the immediate foreground. It has a strong documentary kind of, um, of attitude uh, and at the same time I kind of mix it up with, with soft focus. I find that publishers want, what, like, enjoy seeing a variety of different um, camera subject distances, okay? And um, that's one thing that I really uh, recommend strongly when people are photographing is that they explore this primary, secondary, tertiary landscape, okay? And when you go to a gallery or whatever, mix it up, and uh, I think the uh, gallerists, the publishers, will respond to that far better. Um, these have texture overlays, and um, this is the first foray into digital, when I first did a complete digital um, uh, approach. And this is with the soft focus lens. So again, I'm mixing it up, and we'll take a look now. These are prayer flags with the flash. I'll take a, we'll take a look at Oliver's, and we'll see. Uh, works. All right. So, for me, is I use kind of a little different approach when I uh, actually travel. Usually, the first trip, it's more like the cliche shot. You know, something that I've seen on Google before I go on the trip. I Google a lot of the images, and that's usually what attracts me to go to those places. And then, like on the first trip to Bhutan, I was there with uh, two friends, Chester, that you know. And then <coughs> I was really happy because they had planned the trip for me, so I said I didn't have to, you know, anything to do. But after two days, we figured out that we were on the touristy pass, and they said, how can we get out of this touristy pass? So you are bound by now the hotel accommodation that you have, and it's just a matter in between what are you going to do. So like, here's a really good approach to uh, what we did on, uh, on that image. We stopped at the, it was a bus stop. It's a bus stop slash general store. And we are there for probably about six hours. And then what really, really attracted me at that place was the facade. I really thought when I saw that, they said all those windows, it was almost like, a, uh, like an advent calendar, you know, like the Christmas calendar. <laughs> when you open all those little doors there, that's basically what uh, got to me and I said, if I can find basically a person that basically shows up at this door, that's going to be pretty much amazing. So I was trying to brainstorm and I said, what can I really do to get those people to basically play the game that I wanted to play? So there was these two goats that were behind me in the field. So I told my guy, I said, why don't we go grab those goats and then we're going to try to place them in the front. And then as my background is more kind of a wildlife photographer, I didn't know exactly what would happen there, right? But suddenly, this goal started to butt head, and you can see everybody is looking at this goal. So that basically made the, uh, the image. Out of that first trip that I made, that's the only image that I kept. Wow. Because all the rest was really good documentation images that I documented, basically. But this was so special, that was unique. And then people asked me and said, I've shown that image both in color and in black and white. Why did that image turn into a black and white? Because when I worked on a very large project, like for example, I'm doing that book, right, Culture in Transition, is I want the color to be almost non-disruptive. I travel to the same region multiple times. I don't want the people to, uh, to see basically that sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's green. Mm -hmm. Is I want really the approach of the people, that timeliness of the, uh, the image that I, uh, that I worked on. So. What was also very interesting during that trip, 
on my way uh, out of uh, Bhutan is I met a guy that was sitting next to me on the plane. And then I started to, you know, to chat with him. And I said, so what do you do? He said, I'm a painter. I said, a painter? That's kind of interesting. Tell me more about it. So him and his dad have painted kind of the majority of the, uh, the monasteries, the private monasteries in Bhutan. And I said, so when is the next time you're going to Bhutan? I said, I'm there all the time. You want to be my guy? And he became my guy. So now what made a huge difference is I had access to places that I didn't have access when I was with a normal tourist. And really when I travel, that's usually what I'm looking for, right? Is that access so I can spend more time uh, with the people. So here it's, it's another uh, famous place called Punaka. And then we we're there on the side of the road, didn't know what to do. And I thought that building was kind of a little kind of a, uh, a raw. Is I needed something in, uh, in between that building and basically who I was. Now remember what Bhutan is about, right? It's GNH, right? Gross National Happiness. <laughs> so I saw those little girls that were right there on the side of the road. And then I just invited them to basically come and basically play with me, right? Play mm -hmm. to take an image. Now guess what? When you have little girls and little boys comes with it too. And when you make them all run at the same time, it becomes an absolute cluster. So you have, again, to play the game. I play the game where I make the boys run first, and then after I make the girls run next. And then that's how I get to images, right? It's separating the, or the place that you have. So again, places that are really spiritual. <clears throat> so when I build a portfolio, another thing that I'm looking for is to resist the urge of publishing my images. Because you come back from a trip, and I know that I would go to this place multiple times, and I said, if I start to publish all those images in social media, then after the cat is out of the bag, and there is no real surprise is when you want to publish your, your big body of work. So that's one thing that I do recommend, right? Try to keep it to yourself for a little bit, maybe show it to some friend for some feedback, but the, uh, it's really important to, uh, to, uh, to keep it. As Rick mentioned, <coughs> I like to get different angles. So this was really interesting, it's a nunnery. Mm -hmm. And that's a nunnery in Thimpu. And then um, I thought to myself is, yes, I love this basically the, uh, let's see if there's a clicker. I did love this, basically this candles holder there. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I asked, he said, is there uh, okay if I stand on basically the, uh, the, <laughs> on, on the, where they had all those candles, I said, hey, no problem. They didn't know that I would bring my tripod up there and then I <laughs> all this equipment and then basically there's all the little girls that uh, would be. But it turned out to be uh, really good. And then what I do try is to make it fun for the people that I work with here too. So this is a typical example of what the painter got me into. He is basically, that's a monastery that he painted. And then now when you are there, is you have the, your, the access not just to the place, but the time you want to photograph. So it's a matter of staying at the monastery, which is never really comfortable. Apparently I did ask my guide, is we are the only uh, people that actually stayed in that monastery. And you know, there is one bathroom for so many monks and then all that stuff. But I think the experience was really unique. And then in that situation is, I tried to, uh, I was trying to get all the monks up at about 4 o'clock in the morning and line them, line them up as, as if they were praying there. As you can see, the stars, right, are still. So it only took me three years. And the reason they wanted me to come back over and over because they wanted that image that I had in mind that I had, with, had sketched uh, with them. Um, I think also what I try to do when I do the portfolio is to get the viewer to move with me so that there is a little connection, right, is when, I, when I'm with the people. And then here is what I call transition slides, right, so transition images where you know that I'm traveling somewhere, but where am I going, right? And then there, I'm going to show you a village that I visited on my last trip there, was in uh, 2017. So normally that village is you, you need to backpack for about two days or three days. And with the amount of equipment that I carry, is the, it's, it wasn't my cup of tea. So I asked my guide, he said, what about that road there that I see on Google there? Is there something, some way to access it? He said, well, that's a private road. He said, you know what, if there is a road, there is a way to get on that road. And then that's what he did. He got me to, uh, to that place. 
And then what was really unique about that village, I was actually leading a, a workshop with me. When people got there, is they said, oh my God, is what are we going to do? There is no running water, is the, uh, the, the hotel, is, is not a hotel, basically you stay with some people. So I was kind of more like a general patron, you know, he said, this is going to be the best images you're going to take on that trip. And people look at me and said, oh my God, what's going on, right? And then after we came back from that trip, the only part of Bhutan that they were talking about there was that village, the connection that they made with those people. Because people came to our room at night, they were singing for us, is we had to drink. It's actually that's the, probably the only time that people saw me drinking in a workshop because I had to actually uh, drink when they were, they were there. And then talking about drinking, right? It was all bottle of beer that people were working on. Uh, so very unique about when you travel, you see like the, between Rick and I, the way we basically uh, we photograph, is we have uh, each our own sensitivity. <coughs> and then I think is, that's what is the beauty about photography, right? Is we have commonality that we're trying to tell the stories, but with different sensitivity. So that was the village of Mirac. Yep. However, I was just curious. So, I mean, there's there's this um, real strong relationship that you have with the people, and you're coming in from somewhere far away. You stand out like a sore thumb. So there's that sort of interest. But I mean, it's always intrigued me. People that work so much with people, how do you get people so natural? And it's talking with them. I don't think there's an answer. I guess maybe I'll just compliment you on that. Okay. <laughs> So, so there's one thing that I do is when I photograph any subject that I photograph myself, you have to exhume confidence. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. When you exhume confidence, it's reciprocated with your subject. If it could be wildlife, right? If I photograph wildlife, the wildlife is never going to come after me because they know that I'm not going to do something that is uh, stupid. When I'm with the people there, if I basically start to talk to them, or maybe if I position them a little bit, something like that, they feel really comfortable because they said, we, there's that trusted relationship. Now, the big thing that is happening is I don't stay 10 minutes in a village too. You know, so it's like some of those images has been two years in the making. And then it's much easier on the second trip to basically make those connected images because you return, you give them basically, uh, I always bring back images with me. And those people totally trust me. And then after they bring their friends that I can photograph. Now the challenge that I found is, again, same thing that with the little boys and the little girls there. Right, it's how do you basically separate so that you can actually make the images that are of uh, the value that you want. So, yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think uh, <coughs> if you are confident and, and you have the proper intention, people pick that up, and um, and it's 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 really amazing. And you know, even though there's a language barrier, people can feel that. And um, another thing that I do, and I have my workshop people do, is we carry around the small Fuji uh, Polaroids, mm -hmm. the fast in, in stacks. Mm -hmm. And um, and when we go out and photograph in these out of the way places, uh, we give gifts of Fuji prints, and. Even though uh, now cell phones are ubiquitous, uh, there are some people in these small villages that will, it's very difficult to get to, to have a photograph of them. So, mm -hmm. so to, to get a, a small Fuji print is a gift. Another question. Uh, I, I welcome, and maybe you're planning to do this later on in the talk, uh, but this question of the extent of choreography uh, of, the, of the characters uh, in, sure. the, in the scene. It seems like you have different styles in that respect, and I'd be interested in comments at sure. some point either okay. now or Okay. Uh, Oliver and I talked about, uh, we were going to do a three-part talk. And the first one was portfolio um, preparation, project preparation. Of course, that could take a whole, you know, that could take a whole workshop or a whole two or three days. But then the second part is, why don't we come up with the quintessential image? You know, the images, the, the, the hero shots, the keepers, those images that just really hit home. Um, you know, the, the, the photographs that you may take and you remember it through the entire trip. Uh, now, digital, though, you can go back to the hotel and you can look at it. But in the old days, you know, when we were shooting film, 
uh, you were taking photographs, and, and, and it just, that image, that experience, just sears that, you know, indelibly in your brain. You go back, develop the film, and then you go to it, and does it work? You know, if it does, it's incredible. If it doesn't, well, you know, you learn from it. And so we thought we'd come up with a series of images uh, that each of us have that we feel strongly about. So here we go. So when you travel, not everything lines up, right? Is you go on a location and you want to have this great idea of building a portfolio, Suddenly, it doesn't line up. So what do you do in that case? So I'm trying to find for those very, very unique images. And then, <clears throat> so I think here is a, is a quote that is important for me. While I am in no way the focal point, the images I take are a way of contemplating a piece of my path through a new present. And I think is, every time I make those hero shots, right, I look at the past and I said, what I have done that actually worked and that made me really happy. If you're very happy and then really uh, in tune of, with who you are, you are going to make amazing images. If you start to force, because you saw a cliche image that were on Google, Flickr, Smug Mug, and all those places, is you're going to go there and then you're going to be just a copycat. So it is interesting is I travel a lot in China and then I presented in the, uh, at the conference in Shanghai. And I have all those people that are behind me, all those Chinese, and I could hear them just clicking. And what were they doing? They were taking picture of my screen there. And I said, it's like, what, what are you going to do with those images? They said, oh, we don't know. Well, I know that they're on t shirt somewhere now, right? That's it. <laughs> uh, so here, here's one image there that uh, I, I worked uh, pretty, pretty extensively. So typically when I'm in, in this location, right, is I'm looking for light. Right, and then how do you create light, right? So light could be created either naturally through windows, right? We know kind of the window light. And in that case, it's pretty much an open environment. So it was very, very difficult. So I need to, uh, I need to find kind of a little cloudy day is to photograph. So the first day I went there, it was kind of a cloudy. And then I didn't get those rays of lights that basically made that image. What I did like in that image there was the environment where you have a tree, this is an old banyan tree, and you have the traditional farmers that basically still basically travel there every day, right, to go to, uh, to the farm. So eventually, is I thought, I said, how can I create this light, this artificial light? And then I took some fumigens, you know, like when they go to a soccer stadium or whatever, right, they crack this, uh, this stick open, and suddenly you have smoke that comes out. And I said, if I can find the exact right day for it, I can have people that are running back and forth with the smoke, and then it's going to create basically the environment. Now, everything was working absolutely perfectly until we cracked the stick open, and it was there for about 10 seconds. So, you know, like you're 10 seconds, and then you need, you need basically to have the people at the right time. Uh, so, it, it, is, it becomes really, really challenging, and then now, you have to understand about your camera. How does your camera work and what is, what can your sensor do for you? Because here, I'm really playing with the dark and the light. So in that case is, how would I expose that picture here, right? Is the exposure was really, really important. So my exposure was based on those rays of light. And then all the rest basically became kind of a more silhouette, right? Is I wanted to have more of the silhouette. So knowing your cameras, is really, really important to you. Uh, and then when people ask me, it says, is what camera do you use? Is I use Sony, I use Hasselblad, I used to use Nikon, Canon. For me, it didn't make a really, really big difference, except that each camera that I had had a specific purpose. So I used this camera for years before I became really in tune, uh, in tune with the, uh, the technical aspect of the camera. So on the other one here, it was, uh, it was photographed in, uh, in India, so it's in uh, Jodhpur, it was on the, I was looking for step well, so this is a step well. So what is a step well? It is a place where during the rainy season, the water basically gathers at the bottom, so that during the dry season, the, the, uh, the people could go down and get the water. So I was there, and then I remember, I said, oh, I remember that guy, Escher. 
Remember that guy, Escher, right? And then I said, this is phenomenal, right? He is, that's totally an Escher-like, right? So for me, it was all about the design. So the first day I was there is basically, is the, there were no shadows, right? So there was just Escher. The second day I was there was a little bit later. I started to see the shadows. And I started to see the pattern of the woman going up and down, basically, to the uh, stairs. And it took me, I always ask basically people, he said, how long, does it, how long do you think it took you to take that image, right? And if you stay at the place, if you do landscape, like sunrise, sunset, you stay at the place maybe two hours, right? One hour, two hours, something like that. So in that case, it took me four days. Four days to basically, uh, to just basically make that image. Now, why did I stay there for four days? Because I was at a place where all the rest is Joe Poor, is wasn't as interested to me as basically having capturing that image that would really, really represent what I wanted to say about uh, about Joe Poor. And then here, it's the uh, that was about the Mongolia. That's the uh, Eagle Huntress. I'm not sure if you have seen the documentary, the Eagle Huntress, and it's becoming phenomenal. Because it's a, it's a male-dominated society. The Kazakhs are male-dominated society. And now you have these young girls that basically what they do is they are taking over the craft of eagle hunting. So when the people go there, what they want, they want to photograph those little girls. So with this little girl, she has a falcon. There, right? She has a falcon. And then I thought to myself, said, you know what? She's really, really beautiful. She's very charismatic is everybody wants to photograph her, what can I do that would be different? So, number one, instead of photographing her when she was in a common place, I went and stayed at her house. So I stayed at her house, and she was really busy with other photographers. So one night, she came home, that was about 1 a.m. That image was taken at 1 a.m. So, how did I plan that shoot there, right? Is artificial light. I like to use artificial light that you can see on the outside. I place my flash on the outside. Place my flash on the inside. And then I wanted her to be really interested in the image that I wanted to, uh, to take there. So I saw that curtain, and then I just placed her on the window. It's the window ledge. So she was all excited because that was not an image that basically was common for her, right? They always ask her basically lift your falcon or do something and then she was so excited about after we took that image that she asked me and said can you show me every images that you have on your computer so we are up until basically 4 a.m. in the morning there and then at 4 a.m. it said well we probably need to go to bed because you need to go to school tomorrow right and then uh, she tells me don't worry about it when I talk to a foreigner, I have an excuse not to go to school the next day. <laughs> so, but here again, I, I think for me, right, is that was what I was trying to do, right, is in terms of photographing those images that bring the subject into a different environment where they enjoy. And then also I was teaching a class with Eduardo Fujian here that's called basically stylizing images, right? Where we lose, a, we use a lot of textures and so on. I said, this is perfect. I have my texture and I don't need to do anything else. Mm -hmm. so. Go for it, Greg. Uh, okay. Um, I am a, it's a traditionalist. I don't set up shots. Uh, I'm just a, a traditional hunter and gatherer. Okay? And, um, I work in a traditional way and uh, I'm going to show you three images that I think uh, work in, in, in different levels. Um, this photograph here, some of you have seen this and you may know the story about it, but this is from uh, Patala Palace in Lhasa, and uh, it's during a festival. And this is in uh, Patala Palace, uh, this is in the, the Jokang Temple, which is very dark. And uh, there are circumnambulation routes throughout Nepal and other Buddhist countries. And they could be small, they're called koras, they could be small in their backyard, it could be, long, it could be a block long. This one is about well, probably uh, maybe half a mile. And of course there's the, the, the big one in Nepal that's uh, 45 miles. And it's a seven day uh, trek. But anyway, uh, when I was there, uh, they go in a clockwise direction, and the, the pilgrims, when they go into Jokang Temple, it's dark, so they pick up butter lamps. And so they walk through the temple, 
And then when they get to the other side, they put the butter lamp down, and then somebody's picking up the butter lamps and bringing them to the, to the entrance. And so they're making these circumambulations, oh, maybe for four or five hours at a time. It's part of their Buddhist practice. And so here I am, and I'm seeing uh, these <coughs> doors coming out through this doorway with these butter lamps. And I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. Um, how do I photograph this? So I thought, ah, oh, take a flash, right? Take a flash, bam, you know, I get a photograph of them. No, it doesn't work. I could pose them, choreograph them, that wouldn't work. So I thought, uh, why don't I do a long exposure? Okay, so I had a tripod and uh, set my camera up, I take a meter reading, and I calculate the exposure for 10 minutes, okay? And so I set the camera up, I put my camera on B, I use my hand, I take my hand away, and then the pilgrims are coming through holding their butter lamps. And of course, some of them would stop and they pose. And so what I do, I hold my hand up, keep track of the time, when I wave or whatever, when they leave, take my hand away, and then they would continue. So this is a, a, a series of 10 minute exposures. I made three of them. And, um, uh, and, and this, for me, it's just this incredible coming together of this right brain, left brain, this, my, hot, this, this mind and soul and heart of technical creative problem solving. Okay? And uh, I originally, this, I, when I was shooting at, towards the end of my film career or my time when I was shooting medium format, I, shot a lot, I was shooting color. So I, I, I carried 220. Roll film. So this originally was in color. <coughs> when I scan it, I scan it uh, into grayscale. And I think color negative film scans really well. I think far better than actual black and white film. So it's a it's a it's a it's a one of those momentous <coughs> images for me that you know you think you problem solve, you try a technique, mm -hmm. and it works. And for me, I'm not saying it's a great photo, but for me, it's uh you know it just really it really shows. Uh, what I was feeling there. Uh, this is a photograph that I made recently, well, last year. Uh, we brought a print of, I brought a print of it. Uh, this is uh, a, a repeat visit to a nunnery that I bring my groups to in uh, Mandalay. And uh, I bring my groups and we have, uh, you know, we can interact with the nuns and they're young, from young to older nuns, as you can see here. This one abbess that I've known in previous visits, um, I've known her, and this last time we went in 2016, uh, I asked how she was doing, and, and one of the nuns, uh, younger nuns, said, she's not doing well. They said, oh, can, can I see her? And so uh, I, she went in and asked the, the abbess if I could see her, and I don't know if she remembered me or not, but she said, yeah, bring him in. And so when I went in, here she was. Uh, she was not doing well, and but she was incredibly just beautiful. You know, no tubes, no, you know, machines. She was ready for the next step. Okay. And so uh, when I, I, I went up to her, and and they told me she wanted to give uh, give me her blessing. So I said, fabulous. So I knelt down. Hey, Kevin, were you with me on this? Yeah. yeah. Kevin, uh, Kevin has gone with me too. To Myanmar, and uh, she was giving a blessing, and so as she was giving a blessing, I took a photograph. Now this is with infrared. I shoot with an infrared camera, and I kind of know what the infrared is going to do. It's going to give this incredible glow, especially with synthetic fabrics. And so she's in a pink uh, gown with a, a white blanket, and so I knew that this was going to kind of fluoresce. And so, um, anyway, to make a long story short, when I got back, I looked at this thing, I thought, well, this is a pretty beautiful image for me. It's a personal image. Um, and in post-processing, I think we're going to talk about how important post-processing is. And now with digital, uh, instead of the ferrous cyanide and dodging and burning, which I think is great, we can go into pixel depth and move stuff around. We could remove it, we could enhance it. And so what I did here was there was an iron grate in the window. I removed it. Mm -hmm. And I made it paper white, which is a no-no, mm -hmm. right? You always <coughs> want to have, you know, instead of a 255, you want to have about a 250, 247, because you want ink to lay down there. This is paper white, okay? And because of the infrared, it tends to fluoresce. It tends to glow. 
And so there's, it's symbolic for you know the passages. You could come up with you could probably have just, uh, uh, come up with a lot of metaphors. But anyway, this is a real special image for me, and it's a recent image. Uh, it's an interesting use of um, of infrared. Okay, a lot of people shoot infrared. They do uh, uh, to, uh, landscape. You know, they want the green green uh, leaves and the fields. But um, I shoot infrared for a lot of things, even photographing people. It tends to give kind of a cadaverish um, kind of. I mean, I'm not making any, you know associations here, but the skin tone tends to be really kind of sallow. But uh, I tend to like it. And then here's another one. Uh, this is with soft focus, and. Um, uh, this is on a simple walk down the promenade in, 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 uh, on the Mekong River down uh, uh, in Luang Prabang. And I decided um, for this, for, we had a four day trip to Luang Prabang, I just used my soft focus lens. And you know, soft, focus, soft focus lens on my digital camera, nothing else. I wasn't encumbered by tripod or whatever. And so I came up with an entire series with this soft focus um, lens. Uh, of kind of like my experiences in Luang Prabang, which I think is a fabulous, fabulous city. Has anybody been to Luang Prabang? It's just really a gorgeous, gorgeous area. And so um, I just enjoy this image. Uh, I print it on this uh, uh, the Japanese uh, mulberry paper. It has a real soft image, uh, and I just, I just really enjoy it. And it's kind of you know, really serendipitous. You're right there. Uh, that fisherman in that boat was there. I didn't, I didn't put him in there. And this is right outside of a restaurant uh, on the promenade in the Mekong River. So anyway, so those are my three. So I, I think one thing that is important, right, if I go back to Rick's uh, image there. When you photograph, sometimes you, you don't have a really... It said, oh, maybe that image is going to work, it doesn't work. But I'll tell you kind of a really good story that uh, reminded me that. I was uh, going back into Boomtang, and then I photographed one guy that was playing one of the big trumpet there, right? And it was not a, that great of an image. But on my return trip, I had actually printed that image, and then I wanted to find basically that gentleman to, uh, to basically give the, uh, the image. As soon as I knock on the door, the, uh, the woman came, and then he says, oh, she kind of re uh, remember me, and I gave the image, and she started to cry. I said, what happened? He said, my image is so bad that uh, you need to cry there. <laughs> that I was the only keeper of history. That's the only image that she had about basically her husband that had basically passed away. So for us, right, when we travel to this location is, sometimes is, I'm always generous about taking images, right? If people ask me, say, take images, I always try to you know, take those images. And when I go back is I bring plenty of images that I think is might be not that good, but for them is really, really the, uh, the keeper of the, uh, the history. Yeah. One thing that I actually do is, you notice that I process all my images in black and white. When I bring back images to them, it's always in color. Mm -hmm. It is because for them is they are not used to that black and white. They actually want to see them as a, uh, in, in color there. Um, that's amazing, it's amazing. I've had experiences like that. Mm -hmm. I photographed a farmer in Ireland, and um, I went back maybe three years later, and I went to the, the farmhouse, and I gave this photograph. I said, is, is he here? Is he passed away? And she started crying. Mm -hmm. And um, it's amazing. And I've had experiences like that in Bhutan also. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, um, you know, so photography is incredibly powerful. You know, one thing... Uh, we have a fire or flood, what's the first thing we take? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right. So we got to get, we're going to get going here. Um, okay, another thing we talked about, we thought, why don't we show projects, uh, one project, one location that worked when we were there, instead of we had to go back, we wanted to come up with an experience that was just cutting edge we were on over that two or three, four days that things were just work, work were just happening. And so I thought that would be kind of interesting. And then Oliver mm -hmm. says, well, why don't we try some that we failed? And I thought that'd be cool too. That'll be next time. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, so anyway. Um, it's going to be a four hour session for yeah, the failure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I thought uh, we could talk about, uh, about 
being in a location, yeah. uh, just everything clicks. All the, 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 the planets and the stars, everything's aligned, mm -hmm. and the light's right. So I So, is, I traveled in China, I probably had done about 12 trips, and then I had asked my guide, he said, where should I go next, right? And then he couldn't find a location, so I found a, a farmer's, and he told me, he said, oh, you should really go into the Sichuan province and photograph the Ziyi. So why I, right? It's a, uh, it's a minority. And then he told me, he said, no problem, you go there, you take that road, you make a left turn, and last time I said, yeah, so I, I heard about this, no problems, right? <laughs> so I was there the first year, and then I got kicked out pretty much out of all the places that I had photographed. is because it was protected by the government, the people did not want to be really photographed, I didn't have the, you know, the right guide, and then I said to myself, I said, well, that would be part of that four hours that we can tell you everything that works and doesn't work. So I didn't give up. And then I went back the, uh, the two years later, and then what I thought is said, maybe I'm going to tie that up with a festival. Because you know, like when people are at festival, they are usually happier, and then there is big celebration on the festival. Normally festivals are not my cup of tea, because they are more like kind of a aim as tourists, right? You see usually more tourists at festival. So I got to that festival, and then the first thing is I don't see a single Westerners, I don't see a single Chinese photographer. I said, oh my God, maybe I hit the jackpot there, right? <laughs> and then from that point on, is suddenly my, my uh, frame of mind totally changed, that I said, I think I'll be able to just take the images that I always wanted to take <clears throat> in that region. And I didn't see very many of those images. But I know they were very special because the people that I'd seen about two years earlier, they had all those dirty faces, you know, something that I remember when I was a young boy in the Swiss Alps, and I said, this is unique, is I'm, I'm going to, uh, to make it. So I'm there, and then suddenly, basically, there's people on the road, I'm with a farmer, and he allows me to basically stop at, the, at the, all those places. I'm going to show you images that they were taken in probably about a three-day time frame. So the project that I show you first, right, in Bhutan, you're talking about <coughs> five trips, here is about three days. And then some of the images were in a time frame of about 20 minutes. That's how good it was, right, when I was in, uh, in that region. And I, I think is, why did it really work that everything lines up? Um, I really felt a connection with those people. Is basically, the first time I, I traveled to China was in 2001 with my in-laws. My wife is American Chinese, and then they were telling me all the stories about what China was during the Cultural Revolution, and I felt like, I said, hmm, that's something that I want to basically discover a little bit more. And then those images were taken in 2017, right? So we're talking about 16 years later that I still remember that my first trip to, uh, to China. So I had basically those little girls, and then, um, is the, uh, I gave a good title actually to that thing before I change. It's Summer Vacation, Not Here. So that's, you know. But those are the people, right? Is I'm just basically right next to them and then I'm basically running just past them. I typically photograph always with fixed lenses. So when I, the, the, my best images that I take are usually with one lens that I'm very, very comfortable with, right? It's a 25 millimeter lens or an 18 millimeter lens so I can be very, very close to the subject. And then I have two cameras uh, around basically my shoulders, and then I don't have anything else. I usually don't like to photograph with long telephoto lens. I, I like that connection, right, with the uh, other people. And then I got invited to, uh, to that person that was his house. So I said, this is incredible, right? And I'm photographing, is just give you some ideas there, right, is how everything works out. Is uh, I don't like to shoot high in ISO because there's too much grain and all that stuff. So I try to limit myself to about 800 ISO. So in order to take that uh, images at 800 ISO, I shot that f1.8 at 1 8 of a second. And then it was no tripod, I was trying to hold steady. And I, I told the farmer, I said, can you tell him to stay really still that he doesn't move at all, right? So I was clicking a few images and everything works out. So there I knew that something was basically, I was in heaven. And then there I was on my way back to, to the hotel that night, 
And suddenly these people that show up on the door when I just pass by, I said, wow, this is amazing. And then what really attracted me was basically the food that they had there. You see that guy is eating the food there, there was rice on the floors there. So I knew that I was capturing something that was so unique. And there was no real posing, right? I do like to pose people, Corey, Gap. And in here, everything was, was basically coming, uh, coming together. And then the next day, I went to that, uh, to that village. And then there was that little girl. And then typically in that region, basically, they take care of their siblings. She's about eight years old. And then she was taking care of, uh, of all the, uh, the other kids. And she was the, the boss. So every time I wanted to photograph anybody in the, in the, the other kid, I had to go through her. <laughs> so what I did, right, is I took them to a field there, and then I made them jump in the field. You remember that image with the little girls in Bhutan, right, when they were running? So I did the same thing in the field. As soon as I came back into that street, it was wide open, people were super happy, and then I was able to, uh, to photograph. So relying on basically what, uh, what I just got in the past. And then here is, you might know Bill Owen, right? Bill Owen is a guy that uh, did Suburbia, right? He's going to turn 80 this year, right? So there's going to be a big event. And he had a famous image there, where it's little Richie with a gun. When I saw that guy, he's going to be my little Chinese guy with a gun there. That's the, uh, <laughs> Um, so again, right, is I wanted to, to photograph, uh, give a perspective that it's not only grim for those people, right? There is some hopes there, right? And you, you can see my images, is when I photograph, I always try to put a little bit of dignity, right? Is I photograph people with their you know, dignity. And then uh, basically what they do. And then I travel, and then with that guy, I wasn't on a horse, is. Uh, <laughs> But I went a lot on foot in, uh, in that region. And I was traveling to that village there where, again, those people were coming and then welcoming me for whatever reason. I couldn't understand what it was, right? That really made that, uh, that trip so, so special. Um, so, again, not much pose there is I did look at the location there. And then I said, if someone comes in my frame there, that would be an incredible image. This is very difficult to pose those people that are kind of in, uh, in remote, uh, remote villages because they don't want to deal with, the, uh, with what, what we normally want to do. Um, this image was really interesting there. It took me eight hours to take that image. I saw him coming in the morning there and then I didn't get the image that I wanted so I just waited, waited until, uh, until he came back. And then that's really reflective of what that region is about. It's basically what he has on his back, that's what he's going to use for the next few days to basically cook and then hit his house. And, um, and then this, this kid there was, was really amazing. They had a really good time with this kid. You, you know this, that's the same street that this guy, when I was waiting for this guy. So he was on the skateboard, and then I was trying to actually get two other girls to push him. Because there were two girls that were really charismatic. And the guy told me, he said, do some my girls, that's the only one that pushed me. <laughs> so then after his skateboard, right, his uh, made skateboard just broke. And then here, what he has, I don't know if you see there, he's kind of a washer there. He ran into his house, he came back with a CD, and that the CD was a washer that basically fixed his, uh, his skateboard. <laughs> and eventually, is, I got that image that, that was unbelievable with which is really what that region is about, right? Is the grandparents basically raise the, uh, the younger generation there. So serendipity, I think is, I just put myself in a situation where everything was just lining up and then um, it, it worked, I, I think it worked, is really non-intrusive to the culture and then trying to understand who they were. Great, that's it. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a trip to Tibet, okay. and um, the way that I work is is uh, I'm, I'm really sensitive to the visual artifacts within a city. Uh, I took a class with John Collier uh, at San Francisco State. John Collier was one of the one of the Farm Securities Administration photographers, and he worked with um, with uh, who's the uh, who's the head of FSA, Brian? Head of FSA, uh, Ross, Rossbein, 
Uh, uh, anyway. Arthur Rosta? Is he, uh, is he head of the FSA? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Roy, Roy, well, Roy Stryker, he was the administrator. Anyway, uh, John Collier was involved with editing. And um, by the time I, I got around to taking his class, he was about 80 years old, hard of hearing, but he had his visual, um, his vision was incredible. And it was a six unit class, which was pretty amazing. Uh, and so we, I took it, and uh, we had to come up with photographs every week. There were 10, 12, 14 photographs. And from John, I learned how to uh, become really sensitive to the scene. As a matter of fact, Bill Owens uh, took the same class with John Collier. And if you remember, if you think about suburbia, uh, Bill Owens was really attuned to taking cultural inventories of the scene, whether it was an open refrigerator, <coughs> sod and, and, and on the grass, um, uh, tra you know, the trappings within a, within, a, within a suburban dining room. Anyway, so I like to work, I'm very, I, I, I enjoy being sensitive to that, and this one thing that I, I've always told my students is, be sensitive to the cries and whispers within a scene. You know, when we go to the landscape, for instance, Yosemite, we, a lot of people respond to the big overall vistas. I mean, you, you can't help but respond to them, because they are amazing scenes. Uh, but then there are things that are, that are secondary or tertiary to that scene uh, that are right at your feet. And so these are things that I really enjoy looking at. So, uh, and I photograph people. This is a photograph, that, this photograph of this, of this monk is, I just encountered him in a back room in Patala Palace. And he was um, uh, praying, um, and uh, one thing too I wanna, I wanna mention is I broke my wide angle lens. The second day I was there, I was, my camera's on a tripod and I have this ready fix thing. It wasn't fixed. Pick up my tripod and bam, it fell off inside of a kitchen of a monastery, and I actually cursed in a monastery. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked the thing up, and my, I have a shooting medium format film, my, my wide angle lens literally broke in half. And I, like uh, Oliver is saying, I, I, I rely on wide angle lenses. I enjoy that field of view. It's equivalent to about a 24 on 35, okay? So I broke it in half, uh, and so I had only a normal lens and a short telephoto. So anyway, so when I, I, I said, well, you know, let's make, make do with it, right? That's, that's okay. And so I had my normal lens, equivalent to a 50 millimeter, that I used throughout the entire trip. So I went up to this little back room in the Patala Palace, and I saw this monk here, and uh, I asked him, can I photograph him? He said, of course. Uh, there was an open window, and there was a big card, uh, like a calendar card, uh, a piece of map, uh, cardboard. So I put it over by the window to get this directional light, and uh, I set the, the photograph up, and I shot it. But what's really nice about this are the visual artifacts within the scene. We have the incense, which is very emblematic, okay, uh, and the Dorje bell, the little bell. That, they, that, that the monks used, and then they have the prayer books. And so these were visual artifacts that were all contained within this one scene. Now probably it's, it's so subtle that you may, not, you may not notice it, but then for me, in terms of fulfilling experience, it works. Uh, I also like to imbue um, life to inanimate objects, and I'm sure a lot of you do that, whether we're photographing a bush or a rock or a building. Um, this is a prayer scarf that's hanging in the Patala Palace. The light coming through just illuminated this thing. It was like glowing. And so I'm shooting film, okay? I'm shooting good old T-Max uh, 400. And so I'm shooting film uh, with my medium format. And at that time, we could use tripods within the Patala Palace. So I set, I set this thing up and I, 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 I shot it and I scanned it. Uh, in addition to printing, but I scanned it, and it's just a remarkable image. It, the, this, the scarf glows, and it takes on a life of its own. You know, we're, and that's how we effectively, one way of effectively photographing is assigning meaning to uh, uh, commonplace images, right? I mean, uh, landscape photography is Ansel, uh, Bob Colbrenner, my friend Bob, Bob Colbrenner, you know, we assign meaning to inanimate objects, and here we go. Uh, this is uh, part of the Cora, the circumambulation. They take 10 steps, 
They bow, get up, 10 steps, and they do that for, oh, maybe seven hours, eight hours at a time. And these are, these are prayer wheels. And so I'm there in, in Patel Palace in Jokang Temple, and it's just working. I mean, everywhere I'm looking. And this is not just culture shock. There was a real connection going on. And a, a big part that, that, that Oliver mentioned is light. Okay, if we look at this, there's light being bounced <laughs> off of the sidewalk in front of this, in front of this building. And that's what, that's what really makes it. And then people are coming by and they're rotating the, the prayer wheels. And again, we have the trappings of the ritual of the religion, the prayer beads. Um, this is um, outside of, of, of uh, Lhasa. Uh, these are clockwise swastikas. So I'm, I'm really kind of zeroing in on these subtleties. And this is, uh, I, again, I photograph people. What I'll do, this is handheld at about a quarter of a second wide open. Because I don't want to use flash. I'm shooting medium format, so I'm holding this thing. There's a little bit of a blur. Uh, but I don't mind it. I mean, blur is all part of photography. And what I'll do, and I'm sure a lot of you do this, is when I'm photographing somebody, I'll photograph them, but I will just look beyond them so they don't know that they've been photographed. Okay, and that's a very effective way of doing that. Um, and again, this is inside. This is very dark, but, and I also use a soft tar filter. I use a soft focus filter. I don't know if you notice this, but there's a slight glow to the images. Uh, and it's uh, Zeiss made uh, this uh, dimpled acrylic filter called a soft tar. And it tends to give you a sharp image supplanted with a veiled soft focus. These are money stones. Okay, again, I'm looking at small <coughs> icons of the religion. And, and my overarching project is, um, is, is, is spiritualism in different cultures. And these money stones uh, can be, uh, these are the um, uh, prayers in Sanskrit that are written on slate. They could be tiny, you could put them in your pocket, or they could be gigantic that people strap to their back and they go on, and they go on these koras, these, these pilgrims, and these are probably yeah, uh, eight, ten inches uh, in in size, and they just stack them up when they get to the to the monastery, the end of their pilgrim site. They just stack them up. Uh, you're talking about about um, choreographing. I will choreograph. I will move people with to uh, in, intensify the scene. Okay, I, I enjoy. Constructing the scene, the scene in the same way that, like Arnold Newman, okay, he's the he's the master uh, of uh, of other of many who who, who have done uh, environmental portraiture, and so I will move people around to to intensify <coughs> or to augment these visual artifacts. And this is a the sun and moon, which is a Tibetan uh, uh, motif for yin and yang, okay. And so I will move here, move people around, and I had this woman move a little bit over so I could photograph her by the open light. So that's, that's uh, it worked for me. I came up with a, oh, probably 30 images, which is really amazing. Uh, and uh, it's just one of those things that clicked. I was there for about, uh, about, a, five, about a week. Mm -hmm. So anyway. So there's one thing that I, I noticed too is when everything basically comes together, you don't take as many images. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. usually when you try to figure out if it's going to work or not work, you might click a lot and then after you go into your post processing package, right, Lightroom or whatever, and you have this series of images of those hundreds of images that you took and then you select absolutely nothing. When you get really in tune and something happens, is you don't take that many images. It might be you take two, three images for the different posture of the person, and then after you move on to the next scene. Because for me, is I do have a limited attention span. So I can photograph probably really, really seriously for probably about an hour and a half, maximum two hours at a time. And I know that I can really look into my database. After two hours, my images, yes, basically there is no keepers that come. I used to stay like at sunset, about another hour after sunset, right? And then I could figure out that is at one point it was, uh, it was basically time not, uh, not well spent. 
So that's another recommendation, right? Is when everything works there, try to move on and try to get more and more and more seen instead of staying at one place and then saying it said, oh, now that I got that image, how can I make it just a little bit better? I think you're better off just going to tell more about that story instead of uh, making that perfect yeah, quintessential yeah. image. There. My background is film, and in the old days, or not the old days, when shooting film, we don't, we did, we couldn't carry around a lot of film. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I shot, I, I, I used a lot of 220. So I'd carry maybe 50 rolls of 220, which would be 100 rolls of 120, which is a lot. I mean, my uh, Bob here shoots 8 by 10, and when I used to travel with 4 by 5, I would carry 25, 26 holders. Okay, and that would last, hopefully, last through the day. And then you go back and you download it. But we didn't have the luxury of chimping in our camera and mm -hmm. going back to the hotel room and downloading. And so, when I, and it, I think I, it's a carryover for me that I don't do a lot of, of, of shooting, even in digital, because I think that, um, you know, we have, um, uh, we've developed that, that uh, you know, the confidence and the, the you know, the, we don't need to shoot a lot of, Files and I have some people on my workshops that oh yeah I shot 1,800 files today 1,800 files you know, we were out for you know eight hours ten hours that's a lot right so anyway so Oliver wants to talk about his upcoming book mm -hmm. and uh, do you have any questions so far? No. <coughs> when can we study with you two for a whole day or a weekend? <laughs> Anyway. To be announced, to be announced at the CPA, coming at the CPA, right? <laughs> um, so, what is interesting is eventually I spent about 10 years photographing in Asia, and then now I'm going to release a monograph, and that monograph is going, it's called Cultures in Transition, about the spirit, the heart, and the soul of the people. Yeah. One thing that we mentioned, right, when we build portfolios, right, portfolio projects, I tend to build basically portfolios that are not location based. It's more kind of a theme based. And then the spirit of the villages, I'm going to take villages from Myanmar, villages from China, villages from Bhutan. And that actually ties really the experience of traveling in, our, in that region. So the book is uh, coming out in November. Is if you're interested, I, I probably can set up a, a list there. You can put your name so you make sure that you you get uh, notified when it is is going to come out. And then I do have a dummy here, so if you're interested, you can have a look at the dummy. So this is just a dummy there. The I'm still working on it. Uh, the cover is going to be different. The printing is different, but it gives a good idea of what the book is going to look like. You need to sell a lot of copies. I do need to sell a lot of copies here. Yeah, so, <laughs> support Oliver. Uh, it is going to be a limited edition too, so yeah. that's the... Uh, uh, and then after that is... You are going to go next, right? No, I think that's it. So, we thank you for, for coming out tonight, and hopefully um, we answered some of your questions. And, and I think Oliver and I feel really blessed that we're able to travel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you are traveling, and the world is getting smaller, it's getting a more difficult place to explore. Uh, so we wish all of you uh, happy trails. So thank you so much. Thank you.